Well, I've never seen it better. There's no doubt. The publishing world, the journals, the journals that drive research are publishing stuff on coronavirus every day, and there is tremendous cooperation. The problem we have in the world is that we're all in different phases. So different governments have to come to different decisions depending on which phase of the pandemic they're in. So China's been through it. Korea's been through it. Italy's just coming to the end. Uh, most of Europe uh, is, is, is sort of at the peak or just tailing. Britain, we hope the figures today will show we're going down and we're coming through it. And of course, there's the lag between the incidence, the number of people that have been infected, and the strain on health services around the world, uh, because the strain comes five to 10 days after the peak of infection. And that's the problem we're all facing. We're all sharing a lot of information, which is just great. I've never seen such good cooperation. Well, that's cooperation. What about coordination? How would you assess how the WHO is coordinating all of this? You know, the WHO I always thought was great on infection. Um, yellow fever, more or less how it began, uh, smallpox, all the other problems, Ebola, Lassa fever. And what we need here is someone being pragmatic and telling governments what well, this is, how they should handle the crisis. And governments would listen. They don't know what to do. The politicians are not scientists. They're mainly arts graduates all around the world. And so trying to get some sensible decisions depend on getting really good advice in advance from an organization like the WHO. A lot of universities and medical institutions, like you'll know Imperial College and possibly the University of Buckingham, have been carrying out modeling to try and predict the future of this virus and also economically to predict the end of lockdowns. Um, how helpful has that been or otherwise during this pandemic? I think the problem with epidemiologists, they all seem to hate each other. <laughs> they get entrenched in their different groups. And, you know, I've, I'm an oncologist, the cancer specialist, so I've seen the epidemiology fight over breast cancer and uh, HRT, for example, and gliomas, brain tumors, and mobile phones, for, that's the two examples. And they fight vehemently about it. And we've seen the same here. So at the beginning of this, two weeks ago, the government was getting advice from Imperial saying there could be 500,000 deaths. That's the panic button, if you hear that from another group saying there's only going to be 5,000 deaths. And, you know, there's a big difference between 5,000 and 500,000. And so epidemiologists are mathematicians, basically, that model disease. And now, obviously, very sophisticated computer trends are used in them. And people come to different conclusions. So the advice to the poor politicians all over the world is different from different people. And they're stuck having to make sense of it and actually come to often very hard decisions because no one wants to be cooped up. None of us do. We all want to get out and about as quickly as possible. And the economy needs that to get going again. A lot of the emphasis, 99% of the emphasis, is on the coronavirus. You're a cancer specialist. Are cancer patients suffering uh, to the extent they're getting secondary treatment after coronavirus patients? The, the two groups of patients that are really being hurt by this, outside corona, obviously, are cancer patients and people with uh, cardiological problems, heart problems, because both of those, cancer and cardiac, most of them are not emergencies. In the sense, you don't need to do something tomorrow, but you do need to get on with it. So someone, for example, that has breast cancer needs to have that sorted out. Otherwise, the disease will spread out of the breast into the lymph nodes and then maybe around the body. So if it's only a month's delay, we can cope. That's not so bad. But if it ends up with a six-month delay, and our hospitals at the moment in Britain are coming up to the peak weekend, this Easter, when they're going to be swamped. So and as long as we can recover from that quickly, then everything will be OK, both for heart patients and cancer patients. But if it isn't, we're going to be stuck with a backlog that's going to be very difficult to clear using everything possible, private public cooperation and the private sector, all sorts of other things we brought in. But we won't clear that backlog quickly enough to prevent cancer patients suffering in the long term from worse outcomes. Several weeks into this global pandemic, uh, Professor, what have we learned so far that we can use in the future? 
I think we've learned that we can move fast. Um, Britain's NHS has moved very fast and amazingly, um, you know, to see what happened, how the hospitals are converted into corona receiving wards instantly. Uh, everything was used. Outpatients were all cancelled, done by phone, and now we have intensive care in the local hospital uh, outpatient centre. And that's great. But what we've got to do is plan for emergencies like this again. Uh, it could happen again. There was a planning exercise in the UK in 2016 that was a disaster. It pointed out that we're hopelessly unprepared. We've been much better this time. But this is for real. This isn't an exercise. And I think the same has gone around the world. Every country has had the same problems, switching to from a different type of health care provision based on respiratory care, the lung getting oxygen into people that are suffering from severe reaction to coronavirus. And the biggest problem at the beginning of this pandemic was testing and the lack of facilities for testing. And we still have it in the UK. Different countries have approached this differently. Asia's been superb. And I have to admire the Asian countries from China first, but all of them, Singapore, uh, Japan, they've all done so well. Uh, here, we've done really badly. And there's a big row going on about testing. There are two types of tests, one for the virus, which is a more complex test that has to be sent off to the lab. And of course, it's based on a nasal swab or a throat swab and the sampling error. Uh, you don't know what gunk you're getting out from these places. The second is a much more precise finger prick based antibody test, which tells you you've had the infection. And that promises to sort this whole thing out. If you knew how you were infected, and many of us have been infected and we don't know it, and you knew you've got immunity, you can just go about your business. There's no need to isolate. As a doctor, I can see patients. I can walk in and treat people. I'm harmless to them, and they're harmless to me because I've had the infection. We've got to identify what percentage of the population is in that state. Professor Carol Sikora, many thanks to you for joining us.